Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be in the Lord's house with you this morning. Would you stand and sing with us?
bow with me in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I do hope that is our prayer. My prayer that when the times get tough, that I'll stand behind you all the way, that I won't be the Judas that betrayed or the Peter that denied, but I'll stand with you. Lord, I ask to be with each one here today, be with us in this service, and ask your blessing upon this service as we continue to worship and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. For prayer time, we have our prayer list uh, that you can look at. I'm happy to see Jan here today after not being able to be with us for a couple weeks. And Jim, I missed shaking your hand last week, but are you dancing yet or, or just moving slowly on the foot? Just going through the motions. So, well, good. The longer you can get your wife to wait on you, do it. So, uh, Tim shared with me that uh, Diane found out on Thursday that she has shingles. Uh, she's going through some pain. Uh, so keep Diane Siemens in your prayers. Uh, keep Cooks and Hills in your prayers. I don't know that it's on the list here. The, the youth and uh, Dave and Gary did a good job of walking us through what we did on a day-by-day -day basis this morning. And, uh, and it's quite a ministry down there. I'm glad that we could be a part of it here uh, a month ago. Uh, are there any prayer requests that any of you have or joys you'd like to share today? Yes, Julie. Um, Julie Oh, great. Well, uh, if you didn't hear, uh, Julie is going out for her daughter's, Katie's husband's graduation in June. And his parents are from, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Nepal. Nepal. And, and, uh, and they don't speak English. And they're Hindu. And they're going to come and stay with Katie and her husband for a month. All I can think of is that story you told about the mother-in-law. <laughs> couple weeks ago, but uh, pray that they, uh, they get along fine and, and goes well. So good. Well, hopefully it's going to be a celebration, a joyous time, that graduation. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Dorothy. Your son, and I didn't hear the first name, Vern. Uh, he's in the hospital, and they think he might have had a heart attack. Okay, let's remember uh, Vern, uh, Dorothy's and Jean's son. Any other prayer requests today? Since I've prayed, I'd like to have you just bow your heads and go to God for a moment and pray to him, and then I'll just close. Lord, I thank you for the prayers that have been prayed to you. It's good to be in your house, to be a body here, to, to get together and lift one another up, and most definitely to be here to glorify you this morning for all you've given us, as well as your son who died for each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you continue singing with us?
communion meditation today, I'm going to read from Matthew, the 24th chapter, and from the 36th verse. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then if you'd turn over uh, one page, and from 2513, I'm going to read um, from the 11th verse through the 13th. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. I can just imagine how the morning had started. College students on exchange and high school students on exchange were really happy to return home. And as they got to the airport, women with babies and... and so many of us have gone to an airport know that that by itself is challenging sometimes. People were happy, they were feeling good, that they were on their way home. Now, I've ridden in an Airbus 320 hundreds of times, and it's a great plane. It's roomy, it's safe, but little did these people know that after they climbed 38,000 feet, that within 10 minutes their death was imminent. And I wonder if those people, knowing that the plane was accelerating, going down, and knowing in the end whether they were crying to God, oh God, thank you that I know I have eternal life with you, or that where they were saying, oh God, please save us. I don't know why this is happening. Each one of us, as we gather around the table, know that God sent his son to give us the opportunity for eternal life with him. And the prayer should be, oh God, thank you for the opportunity of eternal life with each one of you, with each one of my brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I thank you for that because I know that Jesus was the Son of God. He came to save each one of us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can meet here that we know that we have the hope of eternal life and that we know that through Christ's death and resurrection, he overcame evil, that he overcame that menace to man that had been there from the beginning, that God's plan for each one of us was to simply say, we know that you are the Son of God, that you know that we have an opportunity of eternal life with you. Lord, be with us as we gather, as we break bread, as we drink of the cup, that each one of us is reminded that you do have a plan for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
to this wonderful day in which we come to worship you. Bless this offering that we give with a cheerful heart to expand your kingdom. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder, you might want to look in your bulletins for the announcement, news and notes, I think, as there's some things pertaining to you. You might check that out, a couple, kind of a quiet week here, but uh, you might check that out. Also a reminder, today is CIA, the um, kind of a potluck cookout today, and you, you know, for us that go to church here often, we know what CIA, CIA is and joy class, but if you're new, you probably go, what is CIA and what is joy? And, and these are just sort of age group classes, people that enjoy getting together once a month or somewhere in there, and they a lot of times eat together or have fellowship together. They support some missions together. And you're probably going, well, is this a special club? Or and This is for basically anybody, okay? The joy class, I'm not going to put an age on it, but they're a little older than me, not much, but a little bit. And the CIA class is... A little bit younger, or I don't know how we decide that, but I'm going to stop right there before I get in trouble. And um, uh, one class is very wise, and one class isn't so wise, I can tell no. But you're welcome to join us. There's plenty of food today at the CIA class, and you don't have to sign up for anything. We just want to enjoy you. So if you have any questions about those things, sometimes when we're in the church a long time, we speak Christianese, and we think everybody knows what we're talking about. And so... Uh, um, these are just groups of people that enjoy getting together, and um, so you can be as much a part of that as you want, or as little as a part of that as you want, but you're welcome to join us for lunch today. We're in a second week of a series called Misperceptions, and or Misconceptions. We said either way, and we're saying it both, but it's sort of the same thing. We have these, sometimes in life you, you perceive something and it's not quite what you perceived, you find out later that wasn't right. You thought this was the way it was, but really it's not that way. It's more like this over here. And, and last week we talked about sometimes we think the church just isn't for everybody. But I hope you were reminded that the good news, the gospel is for everybody. And we looked at that parable of the sowing of the seeds, and he just sowed seeds wherever, and some fell on the different types of paths. But our job is to sow seeds. I want to encourage you, don't ever stop doing that garden. Sow the seeds of the Lord and let him do the work. Today we kind of go a different direction, but some let me backing up misperceptions. Some of you think French fries came from France. Why wouldn't you? French fries, they didn't come from France. That's a misperception. We even have misperceptions in the church. How many animals were on the ark? They went two by two. Uh uh. Read your Bibles. Read your Bible. I'm here today that that's a misperception. They had seven clean animals, two unclean animals, if I'm right. So there was way more than two by two. I'm right on this one. And some of you are going like, our preacher has lost it. <laughs> Read it. Noah's Ark, there were seven and two. And so those are misperceptions. We think, we've heard, we've, we've been taught this, but in reality, it's something different. And that's kind of what we're doing with this series is there's misperceptions out there of the church. The church isn't for everybody. Well, hopefully we decide that the good news of the gospel for sure is for everybody. And today we look at another one that uh, you hear a lot of times. If you've ever invited somebody to church or shared your faith or tried to introduce someone to Jesus, say, well, I'd come to church, but it's full of hypocrites. Church is full of hypocrites. I mean, if you've, if you've ever invited somebody to church, you've probably heard that. There are some people in my mind, conversations as I prepared for this, that was their big excuse. It's probably the most common, the, the biggie, the one that they laid on. I mean, you can't really argue with it. They lay this one on the line. I'd come. But, uh, but there are certain people that come to my mind that as I shared with them, as I invited them, that was what they would say. And I still think about those conversations I had with those people. The church is full of hypocrites. And, you know... Brian, I know some of the people that go to that church, not talking about this church, of course, um, previous church, and, and I know what they're like on Friday nights, and the, you know, the church is just, they're, they're just full of hypocrites. And those, those conversations sort of hurt, and I understand where they're coming from a little bit, but the truth is it's not full of hypocrites, but that's what we hear. You never hear those people saying, though, 
uh, I'm not going to High V this week. It's full of hypocrites. I'm not going there. You don't hear them saying that. That doesn't keep them out of there. I'm going to Fairway instead or whatever it might be. You don't hear them say that. I'm, I'm not going to go watch the football game because the stands, you know, those people, they're, it's full of hypocrites. It doesn't keep them out of there, but it does keep them out of church for some reason. Zig Ziglar, speaker and past his, uh, when he said, he asked someone, he says, we'd like to go to church, but we hear it's full of hypocrites. He says, that's fine. We always have room for one more. Come join us. <clears throat> Easy to find fault in others, and it's this misperception that the church is full of hypocrites, and, and it's not true. We understand that. We know there's authenticity, authenticity and, and real people living real faith-filled lives here, but we also know that the church is not free from hypocrisy, and it works its way into the church, and it works our way into our lives as well. A hypocrite is someone or anyone who says one thing but practices another. That's a simple definition of a hypocrite. They, they say one thing, but in reality, they practice something else. And if we're all honest today, we all sort of fit that category at times. But it doesn't make sense to refuse to go to church. I mean, we don't refuse to go to the hospital because it's full of sick people. That'd be like, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. I mean, that's sort of the same line of thinking. We would go there and, um, because that's where we go to get better. Jesus says, I, uh, you need... I came to seek and save those who are lost, but he says uh, the righteous need a Savior. Don't need a Savior. It's the lost people who need a Savior. And um, so everybody is welcome in this body of believers here if they're moving toward this authentic, Christ-filled life. And sure, we all understand there's missteps and stumbles as we walk step by step with Christ. We understand that even if we've been at this a long time and a follower a long time, that hypocrisy can sneak its way into our lives at times, even, even to a mature believer. So we understand that. But we're going to talk about that today. So if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew 13. We were there last week. We're just moving along a little further this week. Another story that Jesus told, a parable. We're going to start at verse 24. So if you'd turn to Matthew 13, we will start at verse 24. We will read through verse 30 right now and then pick it up again in a little while, so you might want to keep your Bibles open to that. Verse 24, he put another parable or another story before them saying, and again, a parable is just this comparison, right? We've talked about it a long time ago, but a, a parable, that means to compare something, to compare something to the kingdom of God. This is like you know, really was throwing down two sticks and comparing them. That's what a parable is, is a comparison. So he says, uh, he put another parable for them saying, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you uh, root up what the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus tells this story, this parable, and uh, this comparison. And he says, the kingdom is like this. He tells us here, wheat and weeds are going to grow up together. Many of you would understand that as farmers. You, you go to great lengths to keep weeds out of your fields. I remember walking the bean fields as a kid. You know, those weeds were bad news. And so an enemy has done this. And so we sort of understand this. He says, they look the same. We can't differentiate between them when they're young. They haven't matured. But, you know, to go and try to harvest them now, we would uproot some of the good stuff. We wouldn't want to do that. That would be expensive. That would not be right. And he says, oh, we're gonna, it's going to be easier if we let them grow. And in the end, when it's time for harvest, we'll be able to tell them apart. There'll be a separation. Wow. A story that was told 2,000 years ago still seems to make sense to us today. And sort of saying, as you grow up together, hypocrisy is going to be real. They're going to look the same in some ways, but they're not the same. Both good and evil in the world. Side by side, we coexist. And even in the church. We have to deal with this at times. We understand that there's people look alike at church sometimes, but that's full of hypocrites sometimes. 
But in the churches that I'm acquainted with, I'm just astounded by a deep relationship that many have with the Lord. The Christians are making a difference, and you know, it's going to Cookson Hill, it's going to this, it's supporting a missionary, it's praying for one another, it's, it's taking care of a kid, it's babysitting, it's, and there's this authentic, authenticity about their relationship, that they are serving the Lord as they live their lives. And, and I'm astounded that the news doesn't carry it more, but when, and you've heard me say it before, when there's crisis, when there's trouble, faith-based groups are there to respond. There's something about them. There's a realness to them that it's not fake. It's not phony. They aren't saying one thing. No, they sacrifice. They send food. They send money. They send resources. And they go and they, and they try to help this natural disaster, whatever it might be, a flood or whatever it might be. And the faith-based group responds. And I'm astounded that the world doesn't pick up on that. But we keep doing that because we're real believers. And so when I hear that the church is full of hypocrites, I don't see it that way all the time. And sure, it, it works its way in. I understand that. And Satan wins an occasional battle inside the church. But really, there's a lot of great people in our churches. Again, hypocrisy isn't this thing that you deal early with in your Christian walk, and once you've overcome it, you're done. Even as you mature, hypocrisy can work its way in in subtle ways. And we struggle but there's a difference between struggling and being a hypocrite. A believer who struggles comes to God and says, God, this is a tough one for me. This is an area where I'm really struggling. I'm working. I don't want to do this, but I, it's a tough one. I need your help. I need the Holy Spirit, your counselor, your helper, to guide me through this. The hypocrite, on the other hand, in contrast, says, I don't really, really going to try to overcome that sin. I'm just going to try to manage that sin. Have you ever tried to manage sin in your life? Tried to hide it. That's what sometimes we try to do. We try to manage it where I'm just not going to let anybody see it. I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm not going to take it into this arena. I'm just going to manage this sin. That's a hypocrite. That's just, that's just, but lots of people try to manage that sin rather than give it over to God and to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes if you've been struggling with a particular sin for a very long time, you need to decide, is it plain disobedience? Is it struggling? That's sort of the difference between being a hypocrite or not being a hypocrite. Going through the motions, acting like a Christian. I'll make a good front. People won't know. I'll sing the songs. I'll sit in the pew. But when I'm alone, I'll just deal with that sin. I'll manage that sin and learn to live with it. That's the hypocrite. Jesus used that word hypocrite a lot of times in dealing with religious people, church-going people, religious leaders of the day. And that word hypocrite is a term which came from acting in a play. I, I was never into drama. I know that's hard for you to believe as, as good as I am at acting. I would be terrible at it. I, I, I wouldn't be very good at it. But some of you are good. We enjoy go to our students as they act and, and do their musicals. But it, it, this term hypocrite, became, it came from that. And they would wear different masks. I think we have a slide. that Even today, that is a, that's a sign, that's a banner for the Thespian Society. There's, the one was tragedy and one was comedy. And, and even to this day, that stems from way back here in Bible times where hypocrite where they would put on these dramas, they would have big masks, and they would wear these masks, and they would change from one thing to another. And so when Jesus called them a hypocrite, they knew exactly what he was talking about. You're wearing a mask. You're two-faced. You're, you're pretending, is what he said to the Pharisees. I do that in life sometimes. Whenever I go to the mechanic shop, and they start throwing out timing belts and carburetor terms and all that, and they're going, yeah, this needs fixed, and, and we got to time this, and we got to set this up, and the gauge isn't right here, and the gap is wrong, and I'm like, well, yeah, I thought about that, but I wasn't quite sure that was the case, but uh, I'm glad you caught that, you know, and, and rather than go, I have no clue, you might as well, or I do that with Tim Siemens, when Tim Siemens is wiring a house, like he did the parsonage, or he helped him with the project, and he's like, well, this is a three-way switch, and the wire's got to go here, and there's a positive, and there's a negative, and in the ground, and you got and there's 12 gauge and 14 gauge, and I'm like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about, Tim, uh-huh. Uh, that, that's a hypocrite. I had no clue. I just didn't want to look stupid, you know, and, and so you've been there too, okay? You've been there too. I'm not alone in this, and we play these games. That's being two-faced rather than just admit, and the older I get, the smarter I'm getting like, I have no clue. I'm glad that you do, and now that we know I'm dumb and you're not, we're, on the, we're good together, all right? 
So we do that when it comes to things, and, and we don't want to look like we don't know what we're talking about, to, and we get embarrassed easily. A hypocrite, two-faced, a pretender, they don't know, uh, they don't match up, okay? And Jesus says to the Pharisees most often, He called them, you're wearing masks, people. You religious leader, you're, you're two-faced, you're pretending. You look good on the outside, but the cup is dirty inside, you're not who you really are. Pretended to look good in front of all their people, but in reality they hadn't made any changes in their lives. He had strong words for the Pharisees. That word hypocrite is used several times. It's also used kind of in a, in a, in a different way uh, when it talks about kind of anti-hypocrite when it says to love one another. There's a passage where it says, love one another, anti, in a real way, not fake, not pretending. And so that's, that's where that hypocrite word comes from. Kenny Bowles uh, sat under a session he did one time, and I'm going to share it with you. It's in your bulletin insert. It says, you might be a Pharisee if, and I just kind of found it fun, and I don't want to get judgmental here. I just want to challenge you uh, to some of those things. It's kind of like Jeff Foxworthy, if some of you followed him, uh, who, who has a neat faith himself. He's a, a comedian. He, he, a while back, a number of years back, he said, you might be a redneck if. Do you remember some of those? Are you with me on that? You might be a redneck if. You have every episode of Hee Haw recorded. Okay? You might be a redneck if you have ever barbecued Spam on the grill. <laughs> hey, we'd like to join you for the CIA potluck today. Uh, okay? <clears throat> you might be a redneck if. The Halloween pumpkin on your porch has more teeth than your wife. <laughs> you might be a redneck if you've been married three times and you still have the same in-laws. <laughs> and one more. I kind of like this one. You might be a redneck if anyone you're in your family has died right after saying, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> that one takes a little to sink in a little bit, all right? The Pharisees, they believed there was only one way of doing things, their way. They were right. They didn't like to be wrong, and, and that was their way. They were arrogant. Um, they, just, they were prideful. Uh, they believed in traditions and rituals more so than they believed in the Word of God. And, and so they, they had good motives at times, uh, sort of, but it was all about themselves, and, and they were so concerned about being right and doing it the right way that they lost track of what was really important. And Jesus had such strong words for those religious leaders. There was about a thousand of these Pharisees, but they had a, a strong influence. And there was a clash. They were a powerful force. And so if you want to follow along on the screen or in your bulletin inserts, you're well, you feel free to do that. We can fill in the blanks. You might be a Pharisee if, again, this comes from Kenny Bowles, professor at Ozark Christian College. You might be a Pharisee if... You no longer have any non-religious friends. Wow. That's kind of convicting for some here, probably. Again, I shared last week in Bible college, that was that way. We lived in this little Christian bubble on campus, and all I did was hung out with other Christian kids, and, and I suppose that wasn't so bad, but um, it's just so easy to get comfortable in that little bubble of just Christian people, and, and, and we make that our goal. And if I do this on Tuesday night, a Bible study here, and a Thursday night this, and all good things, but pretty soon we've just become a little comfortable in our own little setting. And so I like that one. It's probably a sermon in itself. You might be a Pharisee if you no longer have any non-religious friends. Jesus never called us to that type of life. What was great about Jesus was even the sinners and even the tax collectors and, and those who didn't live His lifestyle enjoyed being around Him a lot of times. Are you always around just church people? Remember, you're, you're not better than the rest of the world. Easy to just fall into those little Christian circles. You might be a Pharisee if you find yourself all the time needing to judge people. The story we looked at today, that parable says, no, we're not to judge. We leave that up to God. Why would we even try to judge the world? I mean, they think we judge them, and sometimes Christians we do, but why would we judge the world? They haven't even signed up to what we signed up for. They haven't, they haven't signed up for our world beyond life, and so why would we use that to bash them? Why would we use that to judge them? 
They haven't signed up for what we signed up for. And so we need to stop being a judge. That's what the Pharisees did. That's why politics and Christianity collide. The Pharisees, you know what they did? They stood around trying to find out things that Jesus did wrong. That was their goal after a while, just to find and nitpick something about Jesus that they could hang him for. You know people like that? That they're always looking for a mistake. They're always looking for something wrong. That's a Pharisee. Jesus had strong words against that quick to look for mistakes or shortcomings in others. And then we throw in the, I told you so. Parents are pretty good at that at times. See, God's Word was never written for us to use as a weapon on others. It was written to help you get right with God. And yet we've sort of changed the purpose of that sometimes. I like this quote from Billy Graham. He said, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict God's job to judge, my job is to love. Simple, but good. Holy Spirit's job is to convict, God's job is to judge, my job is to love. You might be a Pharisee Pharisee, if you honor tradition. Tradition overrode what God said so many times. We do things that even today are so important to us that we miss what God says. If the church service didn't go exactly what I thought it should go like, if the music wasn't exactly what I thought the music should be like, I might miss what God had said. It's true on every side. Worship wars in our churches, designed to bring us together. And we miss what God has to say because we're so worried that they didn't sing verse 2, or they didn't sing the hymn I like, or they didn't sing the chorus I liked, or they didn't, whatever it is. And we can leave church more concerned about what was wrong than what God wanted to get through to you in your heart that day. Tradition. Boy, we have lots of traditions in our churches. Not all of them great. Number four, you might be a Pharisee if you have an inordinate need to be right. I thought I'd see some elbows out there today. I'm married to one of those, you might say. Some of you are saying, I'm married to someone like that. They always have to be right. (laughs) Uh, Pharisees always had to be right. They wanted to be right. Uh, Pharisees didn't always decide on the issue. They just wanted to be right about the issue, and they got mixed up with marriage and divorce and healing on the Sabbath. I mean, Jesus healed a person, and, and again, they were looking for the wrong. You can't do that on this day. And it's like, you know, there was a need here. I met a need, and you didn't even see it. You saw that a law was broken. A man-made law was broken. Man, do we get that way at times, too. Look for the good. Number five, you need to be recognized and flattered. The Pharisees loved to be recognized and flattered. They blew their trumpets. They decorated themselves. They looked hungry at times on purpose. They wanted to be recognized and flattered. They needed to wear a title. Number six, you might be a Pharisee if you need to wear a title. Truth is, we're all the same. And sometimes churches can be defenders of titles. Uh, I, I, I don't care if you call me Pastor Brian, but that's not my favorite t- term. My name is Brian, okay? I'm not nitpicking or anything. But sometimes we put titles, elder this, elder that. Okay, we're, we're all the same in so many ways, and those are different roles we play. But Jesus didn't play those games. We don't need to wear titles. Number seven, you might be a Pharisee if you claim overship over God's kingdom. You ever find yourself deciding, I wonder if, who's going to heaven and who's not? Number eight, you can no longer bring yourself to repent. Sometimes mature believers struggle with this. But if you're not a believer here today, I ask, why, why, what's holding you back? If you've never made that surrender to Jesus Christ, and we talk about Him a lot here, if you've never turned your heart over, if you've never turned your life over, if you've never given Him reins of your life, I say, why not? And here's the answer, probably, it's probably pride not fun to admit our sin and our guilt, and we sort of hate to give in and say, you know what, I was wrong. I've been living a wrong, the wrong way. I've been living for myself instead of for the one who made me. And, but we don't like to admit we're wrong, and if a friend's been sharing with you, we don't even like to give in to them because we don't want them to be right, and we'd rather not give in 
because of pride rather than surrender our lives to a Savior. Number eight, you can no longer bring yourself to repent. Number nine, we'll wrap up with that. You might be a Pharisee if you think your little sacrifices and services have endeared you to God. Funny how we sometimes pray, we always start talking about ourselves. Look at me. I think God's more impressed when we do things quietly, behind the scenes, because He gets the glory that way. Pharisees, they were always directing attention to themselves, always, I mean, putting ash on their forehead, they're announcing that they're coming, they looked sickly and hungry because they wanted people to know they'd been fasting. It was all about them. They were... They thought they had it coming. I mean, how, are they gonna, how am I going to set an example, God, if, if I don't draw attention to me and let them see what I'm doing? They endeared themselves to God. Proverbs eight thirteen: The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. God's very clear. This pride stuff, this Pharisee stuff doesn't sit well with Him. There's some other scripture listed on your insert. You're welcome to check those out later in the afternoon. But what's nice about our story, back to Matthew chapter 13, is Jesus goes on to interpret this story. And so if you would, let's pick that up. He doesn't always do that with the parables, but he did so in this case. So I invite you to uh, pick up here in... uh, Let's see, where are we at? 36, verse 36. Then he left the crowds. Again, he'd been talking to these big crowds, and he went into the house. And the disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who has sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out His kingdom, all causes of, and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus goes on to explain, there will be a judgment, there will be a separation. So what do we do with that? Why be authentic? Why be faithful and true? Because that's the kind of witness that is respected by all, by the world and by each other, when our lives are genuine and true. I love that verse, Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. As we wrap up today, I just a popular poem that maybe you've heard before, maybe you've heard part of it. I just want to read it for you as we wrap up today. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. <clears throat> I'd rather one would talk, walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye's a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing, but example's always clear. I may not understand the advice that you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. As a preparer, I was told that wheat, when it's ready for harvest, the grains and the heads are so heavy that they bow. All I know is someday we're going to bow. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And whether that's the, the weeds or the wheat, everybody will bow. And so I challenge you, friends, you can bow now and acknowledge Him as Lord or you can bow later, but you will bow and recognize Him one day as Savior. Different type of message today, maybe one of those, you might be a Pharisee, if sort of hit home, just see what the Holy Spirit can do with that. I'm convicted by it, perhaps you are too. Let's continue as a church to strive for that authentic faith. Let's stand as we close.
Thank you.